Thank you for inviting me to come talk about this topic. I know that the smart data is not a term that's very popular or everyone knows that. So I'm going to have to um, give some background today. First, what do I mean smart data? I will talk about smart data in the context of big data, because this is the term came with big data. And when we talk about digital humanities, I'm not going to go very broad. We will talk about the context of the heritage institution data, especially the library, archive, museum, LAM services. So this is what I'm trying to uh, get that through this 40 minutes. <clears throat> In case there is some question not clear or uh, you want to see more examples, you always can get the PowerPoint later and explore. So the first part is about smart data and why we're talking about smart data. Well, everyone knows big data, the Vs, like uh, volume in terms of the data quantity, and then the speed, the data come different types, and nature, and the consistency. Also the data quality, so very much several Vs there. And people consider that the data now is the new oil. However, you know, when the data is so big, there are only 3% were actually used or tagged or used by people to analyze. That's why that people think that, yeah, big data is new oil, but it's not really the new oil is like a crude oil, which means if it's just a raw form, you, don't, you won't be able to use that oil. You have to try to do something, refine that oil in order to use that. So this is smart data uh, in the context of big data that came through. So the people are all using different way to explain. There is a whole German uh, book. You probably can read the whole thing about smart data. <clears throat> then some people think smart data means information that actually makes sense. Some people think that big data is the problem and smart data is the solution. Oh, okay. And then the relationship between them, it can be characterized as what it is. Yeah, and then what it is for. So there are different ways to explain. I want to use, uh, borrow the example of a keynote speech uh, at the 2014 um, IEEE conference, International Conference on Data Engineering. The keynote used the example, uh, uh, one of the examples, the asthma example, a huge amount of pe pe uh, number of people, 25 million people had the problem and how many billion pe uh, dollars have to be used in this, all kind of information collected. So now if we look at what the, the view is there, you get a lot of data, you got different kind of data, you get different quality of data, and the speed they come just every more than less than a second, the huge amount of data came. But all of this have to make sense. So this is a problem. We want to make sense to find the value, to find what risk fact actually influence. So for example, you certainly see the air, uh, in the um, hospital, people lined up the emergency. And meanwhile, the air pollution, something happened. What kind of a relationship? How could you prevent this? So this is one of the example. And you pay attention to that view, the value there, that is the one that from smart data, you collect, collect, collect. That's what you want to find out. 
Another example is based on the transportation. It's the same thing that you get every minute, you get all the updates of the information. You get the whole San Francisco area, and you get all the information related to um, the, the diverse and the different quality and different speed coming out. But you want, what you really want is that value, is that value. Can we make decision based on this? Can we detect the onset of traffic problems? Can we try to make decision to announce and then to let people know? So this gives us the idea of what the big data has been um, focusing, you grab the data immediately, a uh, variety of that, and the only a small portion was analyzed, very small portion was analyzed for this value to, in order to get that. So the smart data says we don't need to worry about the great or small, as long as they are trusted, contextualized, and relevant. And also, you can use that to make decision and can use that give the value. That help the decision. And that value is much larger. So this is, uh, I made a picture based on the keynote um, who did the, another event for the Smart Data Online event from the IBM. So, Based on that, we can see this. We will come back with these slides multiple times because each of this means something. And, but the important thing is that the ability of achieving such kind of insights from such kind of data at any scale, great or small. In our library, uh, information systems, we always have structured data already cleaned up. Even we don't say whether it's big or small, we cannot say the diversity, we cannot say the, the, the every second is changing and in terms of, we know that, for example, OCOC is so big, they say we cannot claim we have big data. No, we already cleaned up, we already structured them. So. In the library and information science field, people say they have big data, actually, usually not true. Uh, then the smart data, its relation to the big data is that you want to, the key is that you want to see how the big data can become smart data. So how can make this change? This was the uh, 2019 IEEE International Conference on Smart Data used this way to claim. <clears throat> okay. So how to transfer big data into smart data? Um, in the conference, um, on the Smart Data Conference, they would say, who is, should come to the conference? It's also enterprise or business oriented. So who should come? You can see that you probably see all those terms very familiar. So I made a chart to show the, the, the tracks, the conference tracks, <laughs> including the code tracks. What are the things um, in this smart data conference talking about and training people to do? And you can see the lot of cross thing, for example, cognitive computing will co collaborate with deep learning, will uh, further go impact natural language processing, impact text analysis. On the other hand, there are new interpretation, especially about artificial intelligence. When people at that time say new AI, not the old AI. So the artificial intelligence get the new way to reborn. And also semantic technologies uh, heavily emphasized here, and including RDF linked data, ontologies, graph databases, semantic search, and other semantic technologies all were in this uh, 
2017 at that time for the Smart Data Conference. And this is not targeted to library information science. It's not targeted to academic. It's targeted to the people who do the businesses uh, who are in the uh, enterprise. And this most recently, this year, the Ontology Summit theme is called Knowledge Graph. And so Knowledge Graphs, it's uh, on the rise. Uh, we will see the Knowledge Graph on the, um, the previous year would be, yeah, would be here somewhere, I can see. And now it's going to the top the knowledge graph. <clears throat> so what is the knowledge graph? We all know that when you search anything, the on site is the precise information you want to have, the knowledge graph. So we have a, a search anything, the Steve Jobs, and you get Steve Jobs information, uh, metadata, and related things. So the knowledge graph is not just so simple, just link things. They have several key to, to consider. It is always includes a semantic graph, meaningful. There are ontologies and taxonomies behind that. And it's always include machine learning. Machine have to learn that always mostly include natural language processing and text classification. But the key is that um, the semantic graph, ontologies, taxonomies, what we call knowledge organization system, cannot be avoided if you want to make a decision. So, um, this is the examples of knowledge graph builders. They all build knowledge graph, they provide knowledge graph. On the right side is the Microsoft. Um, they have a big data set called the Academic Knowledge Graph. You can see the in very interesting thing is um, what they are dealing with is very similar to what we are dealing with. Can you see that? All this, for example, citations, papers, um, the, all the, the journals, uh, conference, conferences, uh, things, and uh, the field of study. It's so very similar to maybe they hired the librarians to do that. <laughs> yeah. So <clears throat> those are the big companies and enterprises and commercial field. What about not in that field? What about humanities? So uh, one of the very influential article was uh, published in the Journal of Digital <coughs> Humanities in the 2013, the title is Big, Smart, Clean, Messy, the Data in the Humanities. The key points are same thing, similar to what big data field should. Data has to be cleaned, transformed, and analyzed to unlock its hidden potentials. And data, once you tempt through organizing organizing them, integrating them, then large volume of unstructured, semi-structured, and structured data are turned into smart data that reflect the research properties and priorities of a particular <laughs> discipline. And if you have that smart data, then it requires you get them, then it can be used. So you provide you with comprehensive analysis and generate new products and services. This is totally focusing on what the digital humanities could do. So <clears throat> smart data in digital humanities, what exactly uh, looks like or what we can see that? I want to check who are you involved in digital humanities? Which data we're talking about? And how in DH, as well as where is the distinguished mark we should pay attention now? So digital humanities is a field that you probably all 
know more than me. The, the field is still expanding and definitions are not finalized, still people debate. And there are multiple facets landscape. And most agree that there are two sides. One is D, digital, one is humanities. So the T, D and humanity. But it, whether it's only from D impact humanity or humanity go back to D, that's not sure yet. Most of the paper now is digital technology impact humanity research. And the, it's, it's just, but because of this, the junction that make that, uh, you, you can see the major pattern now, the change in digital humanities. The register that uh, initiated in Europe about all the digital humanity education by disciplines, you can see the disciplines are very um, diverse, and uh, technology, of course, on the first, and art and the culture, it's second. But library, science, and information <laughs> science is also a big part. Many of these digital humanity centers that are located in the world, in fact, located in libraries, in the academic and research library. In the United States, the major DH centers are, can be found in the all those high level ranking uh, universities, for example, in Columbia University. Yeah. So you can see that the library's role in the digital humanities is very, very uh, important to people. Another way I want to check is the uh, recent year's funding from 2009 to the end of uh, 2009, end of 2011, and the 13 and 16, the competition which got the awards for digging into data challenge. And this is a call based on the uh, big data came out, how that changed landscape of humanities and social sciences. So you can see that uh, at the round four, there are 14 founders from 11 countries now. There are 50 winners. So what are they doing? I just went to the short description and check what they talk about. There are three different ways. The domain, the resource, and the approaches. So looking at the domains and areas of interest, I can see that they're widely spread in the humanities and the social sciences. We can see many, many things where um, when the, in the library is serving uh, the researchers and the education for use. <clears throat> but what kind of data we're talking about? This is a very important key that I want to address because a lot of people think data means digital data. We cannot think in this way. I use this um, definition from the NASA um, for the reference model for an open archival information system uh, report that started talking about what does data mean. The examples, so the example could be, yes, the sequence of bit, yeah, the table of numbers, the character on the page, but it could also be the recording of sound and also the moon rock is a data in their view. So data reinterpreted the uh, representation of information. And information equal to the, any type of knowledge that can be exchanged in an ex exchange, it is represented by data. <clears throat> Uh, Borgman had uh, analyzed all kinds of definitions about big, da big data and then came back with the, her own uh, definition that data are representations of observations, of objects, 
or other entities used as evidence of phenomena for the purpose of research or scholarship. So if we don't change the concept, we only think data are 0110 or grabbed on the web, that is limited. We have to change our view. Data is, does not equal to digital data. It's much larger than digital data. And examples from the uh, data universe um, uh, says it's, it's like a measure of all the digital data every year created. Uh, we can see what they come up with. Yeah, used by like uh, image videos from mobile phone, your digital movie, your uh, banking data, your security uh, images, all of this uh, are so-called digital universe that every year that uh, built. However, think about this. Such kind of universe may not be a major or only source for humanities researchers. Yeah. Because a primary challenge in applying the uh, smart data approach to digital humanities is the availability of data resource. For those people who in need of historical data, those cannot be grabbed from the web. Yeah, so those are the major challenges, and those are the data our library, archive, museum usually s serve. Um, let's see, I have uh, a few examples of, uh, for the, the, the what different kind of data. And um, the example from the digging into data challenge, it tells us what kind of resources <laughs> that those founded 50 research have been using. You can see both traditional, uh, unstructured, structured, and digital all across. This is not limited to digital data. And the, the way of doing that is to, uh, similar to a lot of uh, that the digital smart data conference already presented. We can see this. but. In addition to this list of the popular uh, approach, and we can also see the complexity, who and how and which data, all very complex. This is the, the uh, complexity became the theme in the 2019 Digital Humanities Conference. And this conference was attended by more than a thousand people from all kind of field. You cannot say which field is stronger than what. And majority are co-authors, collaborators. I also want to show a few more examples uh, from the most recent year, not just from report, but also from the article. Very quickly, and so you can check later with the uh, uh, original. One is the article that published just this month in Science. It's talk about how the research started ancient Rome in terms of a generic crosswalk of Europe and Mediterranean. What the data they used, what kind of thing they analyzed. <clears throat> they analyzed the, the genomes, they analyzed the ancestors' DNA in order to get the data. You can see that the, quite different from the previous examples used by others. Uh, this is an article. Another is uh, also only re re released uh, a, a week ago. It's a NOVA <coughs> documentary movie about the violence from ancient to today. How that human, uh, what kind of behavior and what kind of social impact and the change uh, made the differences. And it brings us to archaeology site, the labs, and a lot of literature, and the impact of the prints uh, started, a newspaper started, a new novels, how this released the society, made much less violence 
very interesting article. But what kind of data they use? Uh, I made some notes and see that so that, for example, you have archaeology record, but a lot of research was based on the skull, based on the skeleton, and based on the brain. In addition, huge amount of the um, evidence from print, from newspaper, from legal documents. That's another example. It's from a movie. And I have one more small example. It's a, from the exhibition of the Leonardo da Vinci. Um, we have a, the project of uh, coding da Vinci. This movie, you can also see a, a new movie called Decoding da Vinci. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, the, uh, this, this guy in, invested that uh, digital camera and started to collect the data. Um, uh, 13 photographs at 240 million pixels. He analyzed each single pixel of the 13 uh, show and shows the Mona Lisa and shows Da Vinci's uh, pattern, whether similar or not with Michelangelo or with other people. And it shows whether this Mona Lisa was original Lisa and how, why the eye looking at you. And it, any time we feel that she's smiling. So this was an amazing exhibition. It's an exhibition. It's not other way, but it came from that kind of new technology used. So what this mean to us? It means anything to technology made digital humanity change Oh, it's just a methodology change. So if I can say, um, we go back to the uh, long time way we talk about, we use this, uh, from data we know nothing, and then we make uh, uh, information, we mean know what is going on. And you have made that into knowledge, become you know how, and finally, the wisdom is why. This is D I K W, uh, always used. Are we still using this way? So, this was the, another key point I want to remember. Because the big data approach is not set the definition, set the hypothesis, and collect the data to prove or dis not disapprove. Big data is get any data every second coming from different cities, for example, for any health-related issues and move on for where you go. And let data showing what's happening, what, uh, uh, what are related. So what we call that is the unknown unknown. You don't even know what you don't know. How will you collect data, right? So let data speak. So smart data, if we consider taking what from the big data, it's the methodology. It's not the technology changing our digital humanities. It's methodology we are seeing the impact here. It is a methodological shift. So. Um, that's another example quite early in the 2014. You see why it's about the a network framework of cultural history. So why science published something about this? And why the nature video showing the charting culture? It's just a, because uh, it's used data to provide the, uh, information between culture relevant locations over two uh, million years that what kind of things change it. I won't have time to go through, but it shows the different time period. Uh, the the blue, blue dot is people born, and the red dot is people die. And you can see how this early time started uh, in Rome and uh, started become cultural center. And why later other places started to become center. And when the empire uh, getting down, the people goes out. 
very interesting way that find out. And the people from Europe came to the America first in, you see that in the East Coast. And the later after the movie, you will see it go back all the way to the, and now people all die in the, in the West. So what happened? And also what the, why they could do this? It's a reveal, for example, started to have a ro railway. For example, personal car become uh, affordable. So those are the things you're not making hypothesis. The data is showing you what's happening. And I will, this, is 19, uh, this is 2014. Now this kind of research way already very popular, but we can see how that science and the nature grab that at that time and shows the importance. And this also reminds us that discovery is about the non-obvious things. And in this uh, one combined with the knowledge graphs and then the, the machine learning, all of this, you can see that how those discovery, it's become so important in the data analysis. <coughs> and the, uh, remind us again about the methodology shift. But what about the library archive information data? I just tried to uh, grab things together and talk about uh, uh, how to provide the LAM data. Um, in the analysis, publication, and conference papers, people uh, give you all this, which part is most difficult? Uh, store data, analyze data, visualize data, or present? The most difficult part is where? Actually, is from the beginning. You don't even know what you want to collect and where you get. So the libraries become a very important thing for the humanities people. This was a, a report released in the early 2019, uh, 2016 about how the American Library Association surveyed the two sites, library site and the humanities scholar site. And scholars all agree that the, the humanities scholars agree that this is the place they need to go. <clears throat> Another way to show is the conference, uh, in digital humanities conferences, the library information science is always on the top, and also every, almost every uh, presenter have collaborated with archive, uh, mostly our archive people. <clears throat> so in the LIME data, we have structured data semi-structured data and unstructured data. Um, unstructured data is the most difficult to, to process, digital or not digital. Yeah. Well, you just allow them to do um, text or not text. All of them, it's unstructured data. So at the first stage, we do digitization. We do digitization, documentation, huge amount of investigation done to this. And smart data uh, in digital humanities approach emphasize transforming unstructured data to structured and semi-structured data. So how will this do that? I use this to explain that when we look at anything, we can look at three different angles. No matter it's a book or it's a object, or it's ancient, or it's media, or the whole archive. You describe that first. What is this? What category? You take the administrative metadata, what this history, the biology of this object, who holds it, who created it, who uh, hosted or exhibit or used, right? And also the structured description about this. This is from very far view to see that thing. But you also should see the content. Look inside. When we look at the inside of the content, those are the also descriptive metadata, but we talk about offness and aboutness. We talk about relationships, and we make index back of index. We embed the metadata into web, web pages for machine to search. And then now more and more knowledge graphs 
which is supported <laughs> by the ontologies. So we use the metadata to, um, to, to do the content. How about the last perspective? Many of you have done see the citation analysis. Now more than citation, how many people liked it, right? How many people referred that? How many people shared? All of this three way to look at the same thing can make the structured data. Um, so we have that metadata or structured data. What the next step? Next step is datafication, data fine or datafication. To make the machine readable data like our mark data readable, but it's not machine understandable or processable. So the semantic web bring us this step to make machine understandable data, machine actionable data, that's Karen's words, right? And the accurate data and trustable data, and one too many usages, not just stay there, right? So that's the second step. The third step is the contextualization. It's what we're doing now. And I want to see the, the bar, I borrowed this uh, most recent um, thing. <clears throat> the key opportunities, large scale integration and the model driven intelligence, model-driven intelligence in de-siloed and de-duplicated way. Yeah, that's all we have been doing now. And for a long time, we used rule-based system to make decisions, including some knowledge graph. And now, majority is in the statistical machine process, machine learning. However, only statistics does not mean the data will come up with correct and true information. So together, starting another one become a trend is the contextualized um, driven approach. And uh, that's why the knowledge graphs have been doing that. So contextualized is part of that. Another part is consumable. Um, I don't have much time, so I will just bring this very quickly. Um, first, about the how to support DH, providing the LAM data, and then serving humanities research. So the one, two major challenges. First challenge is for publishing cultural heritage collection on the world. We have heard about this from yesterday's presentation. And we talk about this as well, how to make all kind of different kind of cultural heritage contents interoperable. Yeah, we would like to, however, this interoperable also have to be with the way that the library, archive, museum, and information institution have been doing. Everyone have different rules. Everyone have different practices different format, right? So this is a big challenge for us. And I had this uh, interoperability talk at the, in the June for link to conservation data. We have the system level interoperability, no problem. We are very standardized now. The syntactic level, because you can just convert to SCOS and you will be okay. But the structure level started to see the issues. Well, library, archive, museum, and other institutions have their own way to model the data, to define the property. And the most difficult part is the semantic level, because we all use our different concept, different terminologies, different classification systems, and we have all of this uh, mapping thing to do. So this mapping, when you do project, you make sure you know which level you're, you're actually mapping and what kind of issue you're dealing with and what are the standards on the, that side of the standards that help you or support you to make this kind of interoperability. So the, uh, the talking about this from 
um, with the famous Finnish uh, sample, the, the sample model, is that let's try to reuse the ontology. We make a centralized sample model ontology of ontologies to uh, let library archive museum across. I don't have to own any of them myself. I can connect you all together. And this sample model is also important because it has been reused. For example, the first is the war sample, the most famous one that has uh, multiple ontologies you can see here. And with this, for example, about time, about place, about person, about the, um, the, the uh, institution, can we reuse that? in other sample portals. Yes, so they did, for example, the biography sample, which allow people to find any Finnish, we have uh, two uh, from here, um, to find all the detailed information. And they can do machine learning to analyze the very comprehensive information based on this information. Uh, data, but no one is the only holder of that. It's a collaboration of Library Archive Museum, uh, government, newspaper, print, everything together. So this is the bio sample. This is a name sample um, and for the, based on the geographical thing. You can find all the samples and here is going to have two more released and two more coming next year. And the, the ontology is all available in the uh, more than 20 ontologies. If everyone doing that, it will be the way. <coughs> so the takeaway is that the Library Archive Museum data direction <coughs> is from data silo, go to data lakes, what we call repositories. Or, yeah. But then move on to the data planet and eventually go to the data universe. And there's another challenge for easy access and uh, effective usage of LAMP data sets by humanity researchers. Because uh, like um, the summarized by our colleague at the Academia Sinica, that the humanities researchers, they don't know Sparkle. They don't know how to deal with that. And also, after you interpreted your data into table, into that, they have no way to know how to process, how to do. So we need to act, make the linked open data, data sets more uh, effectively used, more uh, better reveal the Unknown, unknown by them. I don't have time to, to go through the details, but you can check all the data cases later. So in conclusion, we, the advanced technology now allow researchers under this big data and semantic web to access and reuse large volume of the diverse data to discover patterns and uh, connect formally hidden, those are hidden uh, data, and also to reconstruct our past and discover the impact as well as bring the more innovations to light. But the, what the library archive museums, we can see the challenges and opportunities both exist. So for sure, smart data will continue and the data provided by library archive museums and the cultural institutes are really the most important things now for all humanities researchers. Thank you, that's my quick. <laughs> There's probably no, no time for a question, but you can yes, always we, uh, we come Yes, we have time for one or two questions, I think. Yeah, yeah, thank you for, for collecting so much information and refining it in your talk. Um, yeah, we, I think we, we let one or two questions. Yeah. Uh, it's okay. 
Are there any? Come forward. Yeah. In regard to the knowledge graph you mentioned, uh, which are built commercially, um, are you aware of reuse of library data or traditional knowledge organization systems within these knowledge graphs? So, uh, is there some reuse uh, of, yes, traditional sensory or, or classifications, uh, which is obvious, many things are, are hidden there, I suppose, <laughs> uh, which is obvious, of which is uh, talked about uh, in this commercial uh, knowledge graphs? I think it's uh, from the uh, approach point of view, we we'll would try to reuse uh, the existing things, and uh, at least not, what do you say, to de-silo and de-duplicate. Right? So we don't want to everyone all sit there and do their own thing and repeating and not share. Is it the more to do that, the less uh, easy to be shared. So if it's an earlier step, you already look what could be reused what could be connected. It would be much better uh, than later to do that. And uh, you can see that taxonomies and uh, what they call taxonomy, actually Cisaurus uh, classification system, ontology, all could be that part. Ontology has also properties. The taxonomies are important for making all the knowledge graphs and the, the ontologies becomes like the key but the problem of ontology is that it's very uh, specific. The classifications are much more broader. They can classify things. Ontology has the property have to be specifically do that. The, the, the doctor has that will be different from the surgeon will be have ontology different from the nurse use, from the pharmaceutical use. So it is an issue still, the challenge is still there. But taxonomy, the classification way, the cesori, the name authorities that they emphasize, that's business, they all figured out. The name authorities are so critical to them to make this uh, become the real semantically enriched and uh, the uh, contextualized. I hope. Sorry for that. Okay. Is there any, are there any more questions? Okay, otherwise, um, then we move on. Thank you again, Marsha. Thank you. Bye.